welcome to today's uh, Game Playing College webinar. My name is Rachel Worsham and my, I'm here with my colleagues, Christina and Jackie. Today we're gonna be covering steps to enrollment. We did go over this information last week, but we thought it was important to go over again. And at the end of this webinar, we're gonna have time to answer any questions you have about anything related to the college going process. So if you're a senior and you have outstanding questions, please put those in the chat box. Uh, if you're a junior and you have questions about the college going process, we'd be happy to answer those as well, really anything college related. And again, you can do that by holding your cursor over the bottom of your screen and you'll see a chat box. You can just uh, type your question there and we'll get to it at the end of the session. So I'm gonna go over and turn it over to Christina. Hello everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started on the steps to enroll um, on a college once you have decided on which one you are attending. So before we get started, um, I just did want to emphasize that for the seniors out there that are about to go and start their college trajectory, um, you are about to enter adulthood. So um, not only are you going out to live on your own, but the biggest reason I bring this up is because now colleges are communicating everything directly to you. So really that eliminates um, third parties. So they're not talking to your counselors saying that you might be missing some items or have some things to do. They're not talking to your parents either. Now college communication is all with you. So welcome to adulthood um, because you are now in charge of your own future. Um, and it is up to you to make sure you meet all dates and deadlines and complete all items. Of course, we are here to help. So are your parents, so are your counselors, so is the Game Plan College team. But it is now the responsibility falls on you. So let's begin. Um, each college and university has their own list um, and their own unique portals and their own unique first year checklist. So for wherever you have decided to go, your first step is to find out that new, that first year enrollment checklist, or maybe it's called new student enrollment checklist, or just first year enrollment checklist. They're all called differently, um, but it's your responsibility to first look that up. Some are, some enrollment checklists are longer than others. So say a college, some might have like 20 items on that checklist, but another, another college might only have 10 items on that checklist. That doesn't mean the one with 20 items, you have to do more. Um, typically, there are a lot of steps and not all checklists, they may not be as detailed. So this presentation today is gonna go over everything that we could think of. Um, this is not a full list as there may be some things that are particular to your school. Um, and that additionally, um, you know, it's not a full list. So it's your responsibility to make sure you know your specific school's list. But this is everything that we could think of. So to make sure that you have committed and to reserve your spot for school, the first step is to um, that nationally happens on May 1st. May 1st is National Decision Day, when typically all students have to submit that deposit to confirm, yes, I am attending your school. Um, we're going to go over how much the deposits are in a second, but, and I would say a lot of schools right now are extending that due to the coronavirus, but to our knowledge, um, since most of our audience is here in the Durham community, um, and a lot of our students do go to public schools, to my, our knowledge, as of right now, public colleges and universities in North Carolina have not extended um, their deadline. So you do have to let them know by May 1st that you will be attending. Um, we know that times are um, tough at this time and that you may need some more time. If that is the case, I recommend you reach out to your admissions office today, no later than tomorrow, because May 1st is this Friday. So if you don't reserve your seat by this Friday anywhere, you are not confirmed to show up anywhere for the fall. So make sure you get that enrollment deposit taken care of. The second step is to register for orientation. So typically at orientation, um, you register for classes and so that's why this is important. And then uh, another step is to apply for housing. These all happen in May. So um, I would say the big, these are the big three. You need to pay, confirm that you're showing up, confirm that you have classes 
um, register for and confirm that you have a place to live for you to be set up to walk onto campus for the fall. Um, there's still a lot more steps that go into this, but um, these big three are super important and are the most rapidly approaching deadlines. You must, must, must do these big three in order to confirm that you are set up for the fall. Here are a couple of examples um, of some of our most popular schools. So in North, you know, for East Carolina, or as you can see, enrollment deposits um, can be as little as zero. Some schools don't charge enrollment deposits. Um, some charge um, a little bit more than 100. It varies per school. So it is um, up to you to make sure you know what that is and get that taken care of for May 1st. So what they do all have in common, although their deposits vary, is that they all have to be turned in by May 1st. You have to let them know you're showing up. Um, orientation, this varies per school on um, how they're going to conduct orientation. More than likely, um, they are all going to be virtual unless anything changes um, in the, you know, in the coming, in the near future. But um, as of right now, schools, some have opened up orientation and you can register now. Others are opening soon, like East Carolina. Um, UNC Greenberg right now projects that they'll host in-person orientations in August, that is still all up in the air. So orientation, um, the deadlines for you to register for those, some are mid-July, some are early May. So you do wanna get that registered as early as possible. Um, and actually early May for NC State, that's incorrect. They're releasing information on how they're on um, registering for orientation early May. So you just wanna get that as soon as possible. Housing, we, we don't know whether you will be able to actually move in this fall 2020 into housing, but it is important that in the case that we are ready to move in, or whether even if it's not in August, maybe it's October or December, you wanna have a place to be able to show up to campus. So housing is a very big part of making sure you're ready. So make sure you apply for housing. That typically goes through an application. So schools need to know that you plan to use their housing. Um, you'll have contracts you need to sign, et cetera, and read through. Um, maybe it'll require a survey for you to find a roommate. Um, different schools have different deadlines. Um, they may or may not have deposit for housing and for orientation. So you can see the total fees for this big three per school. Um, now these fees for orientation, they may change because orientation usually covers you staying on campus um, one night over the summer, as well as you eating on campus. Um, so since it's virtual, we don't know that the cost of change. We just don't know what that is yet. Um, and as I'm going through this, feel free to enter any question in the chat box. I will be checking it and we can also go over it. So once you get taken care of your big three, which is confirming your enrollment, um, signing up for orientation and signing up or registering for housing, there are a couple of other steps that come along in May. For example, in order, you are likely right now, um, seniors, getting a lot of emails that you may not have access to. And so you get those emails. Once you're an accepted student, you usually get an email for that school. Um, it might be temporary if you're still deciding, or if you've already decided, um, you have your student email for the school you're going to attend. So it's super important that you create a username and password for your email. You'll also have an account that's um, similar to an admissions account and similar to the account where you get your financial aid, um, there's gonna be a third or it might be a new account where you actually are able to see your financial aid or see your bills. Um, this account has everything comprehensive that a student would need access to. So make sure you get access to that account. Um, and additionally, right now, even though you have submitted all of your financial aid, um, your FAFSA, um, your CSS profile, if it applies, um, you need to make sure that you have access to it. So um, if you don't have your financial aid at this time, it means that they may be missing some additional paperwork, or even if they provided you a preliminary financial aid, they might still need more paperwork. So just make sure that it's all taken care of. Along with that financial aid paperwork, um, you're likely gonna have to do item on your account once you say 
yes, I'm coming to the school. And if the school has some loans in that financial aid package that you will need to take, or even if you um, do not need to take those loans, if those loans were offered to you, you will likely have um, an item on your account to do something called entrance loan entrance counseling. Or you might have an item that says you need to sign your master promises, promissory note. What that means is that the school said, based on your package, we think you might need these loans. You may or may not take them, but if you need to take them, how we will know is you need to make sure you get informed on what it means to take out a loan from the government. And we need to know that you um, have signed that contract with the government. And that's what that master promissory note is. Um, usually you'll get emails from federal student aid um, you just sign in. Um, entrance loan counseling is just reading about the loans, all that it entails. At the, at, you might have some, a couple of questions throughout. And then at the very end, you sign that contract between you and the government that says, um, I, Christina Villegas, am taking out $2,000 in loan for the fall 2020 to spring 2021 year. And then your school gets that, and that's how they give you your loan. So, I, this may or may not be something you do in May, but it is important that you, it may already be an item on your account. Um, so we just wanted to put it on your radar um, and that needs to be done as soon as possible um, so you can get that loan as part of your financial aid. We're now gonna switch it over to Michelle who's gonna talk about steps from June and onward. Okay, let me just, Get this going. Okay, can everybody see that? All right. So after you graduate, there are still things that you need to do to make sure that you are ready to be on campus in the fall or online in the fall, whatever it's going to look like. So you need to make sure that you send your final transcripts from your high school as well as your AP and IB test scores to your college. So the reason that colleges wanna see your final transcript is they wanna make sure that you didn't get accepted into college and then stop attending school or stop trying. Um, they also are gonna to wanna to see your AP and IB test scores to see if you can maybe place out of some of the entry level English or math courses. So that'll help you in your scheduling. So make sure that you do that as soon as possible, uh, as soon as your final grades are in. Your, your high school probably has a process by which they do this. So you might hear from your counselor in the coming weeks saying, where have you decided to go to college? We need their address. So make sure that you pay attention to that and that you give your counselor uh, the correct information. So the next thing you'll need to do is submit your health and immunization forms. It is a requirement if you are to live on campus that you have certain immunizations. So the good news is if you have been in the US since you were a baby, you probably have a lot of these immunizations already done. Some of the immunizations you might need are meningitis. It's just one shot. Uh, so make sure that you check on your college website to see which immunizations they require try to locate your uh, immunization record, see what you need, get those shots, and then send that to the college. They will need to see a copy of your immunization record. So uh, if you don't have it at home, you might be able to find it, or you might be able to ask your doctor's office who will have some sort of online or paper copy. Uh, just a note, I know none of us really want to go to the doctor right now, um, but a lot of pediatricians and doctor's offices are remaining open for wellness checks for healthy people. Uh, they're letting very few people into the door at a time. So if you do need to get shots, don't be nervous to go to your uh, general practitioner. Uh, you will need to submit these forms very soon after you enroll. Colleges can, if you are living in the dorm your first year, they can kick you off campus if you have not submitted your health and immunization forms. The deadlines for this vary by college. So again, this is all very general, but make sure that you're checking up 
on all of these requirements for the colleges that uh, for the college that you plan to attend. Another thing you'll need to do regarding your health is either enroll in or waive your student insurance. So if you do not waive your student insurance, you're going to see a $1,300 bill on your um, tuition bill when you get it. So the reason that you might be able to waive your student insurance is if you are still covered under your parents' insurance. If you are not covered under your parents' insurance, you will need to enroll in the student health insurance. Um, there are some funds available at certain schools if this is uh, too expensive for you. So make sure that you check in at the school. If you're receiving a lot of need-based aid, it is possible that they will be able to uh, pay for your health insurance as well. So make sure that you advocate for yourself there. Oh, let's see. So just a note, here are the required immunizations if you're attending college in North Carolina. Like I said, most of these you got when you were a baby, but uh, vaccines like meningococcal meningitis, you might need to get, I had to get that before I uh, moved in my freshman year. So some other things you'll need to do, like we said, attend orientation, whether that be online or in person. You'll need to register for classes. Typically, you do this at orientation. The way that it traditionally looks is that you meet with an academic advisor and then your orientation leader, who's a student staff member that kind of leads you through the whole process, will sit with you in a computer lab and help you register. If it is online, it is likely that you'll still be able to meet with an academic advisor who will say, you know, what do you want to major in? I see that you've taken these classes. Um, this is what I think you need to take. Just a note, you will be the last people on campus to register for courses, so your schedule may not look exactly how you want it because everybody else who has already been at that college has enrolled in courses already. They enrolled back in March. So don't be disheartened if your schedule isn't perfect. Uh, I remember my freshman year of college, I registered at orientation and had classes on Tuesday and Thursday. And I was like, this is not gonna work for me. As the semester starts, people stop dropping out of courses and you're often able to get into the classes that were closed. So you may need to keep an eye on your enrollment uh, wizard, whatever they call it, where you are, uh, to you know, finagle with your schedule as the semester starts. Uh, you also need to buy books for your courses. So you can, I would say the easiest way to do this is through your college's bookstore. You give them your class list and they put all your books together in a box and give it to you. That's the easiest, but it is certainly not the cheapest way to do it. In fact, it's probably the most expensive way to do it. Alternatively, you can get your book list from your school's bookstore and then go buy them on Amazon or a used bookseller or something of that nature. Uh, something you might want to look into as well is whether your college puts books on hold in the library. So typically, uh, your instructors send the book list to the library and they put one copy of each book on hold for the whole semester. So you can go into the library. You can't check it out, but you can read the book in the library, maybe make a copy of some pages. Uh, so if that's going to be cost prohibitive to you, that's an option. So the next thing you might need to do is take placement tests. So this is especially true for math and foreign language. I believe at all public colleges in North Carolina, you're required, you have some sort of foreign language or math requirement. Uh, so these tests are online and they aren't, if you, you know, do great on it, great. If you bomb it, that's fine. They're not gonna rescind your admission offer. The reason that they do this is because they wanna place you in the correct level of your foreign language or math course. So if you are fluent in German and you take the German placement test, they're not gonna put you in German 101. They're gonna put you in a German lit class for your requirement. So please take these tests. They're very, very important. Uh, and it just helps set you up to succeed. You'll also need to buy a laptop. So many colleges, uh, well, all colleges have 
on campus computers. So they have computer labs that you can access. You can go to the library and use those computers. But if you plan on doing any work off campus or you want to work in a computer lab, you'll need to buy a laptop. Many colleges have uh, programs for students who can't afford uh, they will provide you some sort of grant or they have some sort of scholarship fund. So make sure that you look into that. Uh, another option is buying a used laptop. It may, you know, weigh 20 pounds and not be as fast. However, it's cheaper. Um, often people ask their family members if they have an extra laptop laying around. So you might need to get creative, but uh, laptops are pretty important to have. You'll also need to buy some dorm room necessities. So when you move into your dorm room, the only things that will be in the room are two beds, two mattresses, two desks, and two chairs. You will probably have some sort of closet, but there won't be any hangers or any mirrors or anything like that. So you'll need to buy bedding, any shower equipment, a shower caddy. Uh, if the college doesn't provide microwaves and mini refrigerators you might need to purchase those you don't have to buy all of this new many students move on campus their first two years and then move off campus and they have no need for these um you know shower cavities and microwaves and tiny fridges so if you know anyone that is in college now and is planning on moving off campus maybe ask if you can buy those items off of them at a reduced rate uh, just a note, you're probably going to be walking around campus a lot. Uh, so make sure that when you go to college, you have footwear that is comfortable. In high school, you can probably get away with walking around in wedges uh, because you're walking like 20 feet from one class to another. But I know when I started college, I had to walk 25 minutes up a hill to get to my classes. So make sure that you're keeping that in mind, buying uh a rain jacket or an umbrella in case it rains because classes aren't canceled if it rains. So just think about what you might need uh, when you're navigating campus. You will also need to sign up for a meal plan. So if you live in a residence hall, you may have access to a full-size refrigerator and stove, but you also may not. So you can do research on the college's websites to see what kind of facilities are going to be in your residence hall. If you really like to cook, uh, you can opt out of a meal plan, but it's, I wouldn't advise it unless your residence hall has very nice, you know, kitchen facilities because a lot of people are going to be using it. There are different levels of meal plans. So you can have an unlimited meal plan where you can go to the dining hall, you know, nine times a day and it'll still cost the same. You can also buy a certain number of meals per week or per month. So I believe my first year I had a meal plan with two meals in the dining hall a day and then I had something called flex dollars on the side that I could use on on-campus restaurants so I could go to the Chick-fil-A in the student union uh, or grab a bagel or something like that. So just think about what you need. Uh, you're gonna probably want to opt for the cheaper option but just remember um, Eating is important to keep your brain going. So even though you may be tempted to say, oh, you know, I'll just get one meal a day and like eat macaroni and cheese the rest of the meals. Uh, if you can afford to, you know, allow yourself a little bit more flexibility there, uh, I would advise it just because you don't know how your schedule is going to look, what your life is going to be like, what you're going to need uh, when you get to college and you don't want to be worried about food. Uh, let's see. So the next thing you'll need to do is ensure that all your prescriptions are up to date and can be transferred to campus health. So if you're taking any medicine that you have to go get from a pharmacy, make sure that you transfer that prescription to your campus health. Uh, and also, if you received any sort of academic or physical accommodations in high school, uh, for example, if you needed extra time on tests, or if you um, are differently abled and stairs are difficult for you, make sure that you contact your uh, campus office of accessibility resources and services. It might be called something different at every college. 
but unless you contact these offices, they're not going to know what you need. So it's not like, uh, you know, high school where your 504 or your accommodations traveled with you throughout your time in school. That's not how this works here. You have to tell the offices what you need and they'll be able to work with you. This is especially important um, for picking your residence hall. So if you have asthma and you can't be in old buildings or if you, uh, like I said, stairs are difficult for you, you need to be on the first floor. That's something that you need to um, advocate for sooner rather than later so you can get what you need as far as your housing goes. So that's all that I have. Uh, I saw some questions in the chat box and I'll get to those in a minute. Just a reminder to please fill out our survey at bit.ly forward slash GPC workshop for a chance to win $20. We draw these every week. Uh, just a reminder, we have more information sessions this week. Uh, you can see the full schedule at bit.ly forward slash GPC virtual. And then just a reminder to follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel where all of these videos will be posted. So I saw some questions in the chat box. Again, if you have any questions, please put those there. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with these. If students have to take out loans to afford college, what's the maximum loan amount you recommend that students take total after four years? Uh, so it really depends. Uh, in our financial aid webinar, we talked about the different kinds of loans. So there are federal loans, and then there are private loans. You, only, you can only take out a certain amount each year in federal loans. So your first year, you can only take out $5,500 in loans. Uh, if the choice is between taking out $5,500 each year and not going to college at all, I would say that uh, your best shot is gonna take out the loans because the earnings premium, so the, um, the amount more that you will make with your college degree will more than make up for that you know, $25,000 you have in debt. Additionally, those interest rates are relatively low. It's around like four and a half percent. And you have many, many repayment options. So if you're making $30,000 a year, uh, you know, you're not going to have to pay as much as someone who comes out making $200,000 a year. Uh, that's called uh, income-based repayment. So it's really up to you. Like we said, we really don't recommend you take out private loans. That's where you see, you know, in the news and people are like, oh, I came out of undergrad with $300,000 in debt. There is absolutely no way you can amount to that money unless you're taking out private loans. Those private loans have very high interest rates. Uh, they're not backed. It's not through the federal government. So we, we suggest that you don't take out private loans, but if it's a federal loan, uh, there's a high chance that you'll be able to repay it uh, and not bankrupt yourself. Uh, let's see. Do colleges accept Medicaid in lieu of medical insurance requirement? Christina, no. Um, just last fall, they were accepting Medicaid in lieu of medical insurance, but I believe that as of 20, 2019, so or what the spring semester um, of this past academic year, um, they have not allowed for Medicaid. So students must enroll in the student blue health insurance or um, if they're enrolled in their own parent insurance. Um, the student health one is pretty expensive. I haven't done research to see if there are any out there that might be cheaper, but if you can find one that's cheaper, I would say definitely go for it. As long as you have an insurance, you should be fine. And again, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat box. So Rachel, this was a lot of information. Let's just say I'm a senior right now and I am I think I know where I'm gonna go. And I've just now heard this presentation, I'm like where should I start? Because I feel overwhelmed with everything right now. 
So the most important things that you can do right now are the big three that Ms. Christina talked about. So uh, if you take a look at your calendar, today is April 27th. So it's almost May 1st. So what you need to do is tell the college that you're coming. So however they want you to RSVP, it may include an enrollment deposit. If you think that paying for an enrollment deposit is gonna be an issue, you need to email someone in uh, the registrar's office or admissions or financial aid, I'm not sure. It will depend on the college today, like right now, pull up your email and email them and let them know that you might have a problem paying for the enrollment deposit. Uh, we have a student that did that and encouraged their friends to do that and all of them got their enrollment deposits waived. So colleges are being really flexible, which is nice. So RSVP, pay our enrollment deposit. Look at housing. So you wanna make sure you have a place to live. And then the third one is register for orientation. So the, those are the three most important things you should be doing in the next two weeks. Then you can start looking at uh, your immunizations. I would say that's probably the most important thing. Figuring out health insurance. Again, if it's going to be financially burdensome for you, make sure that you check and see if your college has any um, adjustments they can make. So we know UNC Chapel Hill has a form that uh, comes out in June that you can fill out that says, I need you to adjust my aid package because I can't afford health insurance. So make sure that you're on the lookout for that. Uh, and then finally, the fun stuff. So looking at things, um, you know, stores open, going to Target or Walmart and picking out a comforter, um, thinking about the books you need, uh, things of that nature. Does anyone else have any questions about this presentation or anything college related? All right, well, if that's all, uh, just a reminder, I'm gonna post the link to the survey that we have. Please fill that out um, so we can make sure that these are webinars that you need and want. And also you'll be in the running for a $20 gift certificate. Just a reminder, we have, um, oh, I put the link wrong again. All right, let me try this again. Um, oops. Uh, just a reminder, we have more workshops this week. We have several college information sessions. So um, if you're interested in any of those, please go to this link. Uh, bit.ly dot or bit.ly forward slash GPC virtual to see our schedule of events. And we hope to see you later this week. Thank you.